If you enjoy this program, please like and subscribe. And I can go on and on. The early Christians all believe in the oral Torah. And if you would have told the early Christians that there's no oral Torah, they would have sent you to a psychiatrist. However, the church changed and divorced themselves from the oral Torah unless the oral Torah can get them out of trouble. Hi, this is Matt uh, from Detroit. Um, I don't know if you've ever covered this before, but I was just curious how uh, Jesus could have known that someone had uh, oversized tefillin on unless he was familiar with the oral tradition. Um, in, in, uh, in one uh, uh, place, it says that he was, he was critical of a guy for having uh, enlarged phylacteries, and I just said, uh, is there any other way he could possibly have known that uh, that this person's tefillin were too big without being familiar with the oral tradition? And uh, if that's the case, is the text implying that Jesus himself is a Pharisee, which I think it kind of does? I'm just curious about that. You Thanks. So as it turns out, the Christian Bible presents Jesus as a Pharisee, but that text in Matthew 23, verse 5, would definitely not be the passage that I would use to demonstrate that from the view of the writers of the New Testament, Jesus was a Pharisee. I'll just clear up these terms for a moment, because the word Pharisee is an anachronism. You know, people don't use that term anymore. And in fact, in in dictionaries, the word Pharisee often is notated as a pejorative. And you can imagine how that happened. But the word Pharisee means that someone believed in the written and oral Torah, and it is the exact equivalent of the term we use today, Orthodox Jew. So that's really important. According to Josephus, at the time in the first century, there were three major sects of the Jewish people, three different denominations. Um, there were the, the Pharisees. Those are the Orthodox Jews. The, Jews. the Pharisee really comes toward Purushim, which means they separate themselves. They don't uh, integrate with the rest of society. There were another group that you're familiar with, the Sadducees, who rejected the Oral Torah and also rejected the belief in life after death or the resurrection of the dead. And a third group that Josephus spends little time on, that's the Essenes. And until the 20th century, the Essenes were the least known, least talked about group. But because of a discovery in 1947 in Qumran of the most important biblical discovery, archaeological discovery, certainly in many centuries, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and scholars came to believe that the authors of the scrolls, or I should say that, I should say that differently, scholars believe that those who lived in Qumran, who preserved the scrolls, were Essenes. So they, just in recent um, history, became popular. So as it turns out, from the Christian Bible, you're not asking about what did the historical Jesus really do, how did he live his life. He probably was a Pharisee. And bear in mind that the passage you're referring to in Matthew 23, in which it's a, it's a, it's a chapter that's very, very critical of Jews, very critical— so that Jesus uh, criticizes the Jews who are wearing large phylacteries. That's tefillin. 
So the point in that chapter is that they're hypocrites and vipers outwardly displaying their religiosity, but inside they are hollow tombs. That's essentially the language. They're hypocrites. In the caves of Qumran, many phylacteries were discovered and on display in the Israel Museum today. You can go to the Israel Museum. Right now, It's I can get there by train in just a few stops, and you could see phylacteries that are 2,200 years old. The fact that he observed that is not the indicator that Jesus himself was a Pharisee. The indicator is much more explicit than that. The Pharisees are in the Christian Bible. They were the gold standard. Look, if you were a reform, a conservative Jew, and you're watching me now, please don't be offended. Okay, just don't. Okay, but Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Judaism, that's kind of the standard. If you want to know, you know, if something's kosher, so if a conservative Jew wants to find a kosher chicken, he he wants to find it with a certification from an Orthodox rabbi, an Orthodox agency. You know, the Reform Movement is not producing, they're not overseeing, you know, kosher things. Or it's Orthodox Judaism. If you want a Torah scroll, it's the, the author, the scribe is Orthodox. That's the standard. And that's what we find in the Christian Bible. In the Christian Bible, in fact, in that same chapter, Matthew 23, we are told, the chapter opens up by first saying that the Pharisees and the scribes sit in the seat of Moses, which means the information they're conveying to you is directly from God, and you whatever they tell you must follow. Now, the church eventually is going to reject the oral Torah, and missionaries today hate the Talmud, hate the oral Torah, unless— There's one caveat. They love the Talmud. They love the oral tradition. They love Midrashic literature if it will help them in rescuing their manifold problems when teaching their distorted view of the Bible. If they could find anything in rabbinic literature that can possibly be construed to support what they believe, they all become Lubavitchers. Suddenly, they all become Pharisees, and they have no problem quoting rabbis. And in fact, when I'm dealing with and debating Christians, they do this so frequently, and they do this because it's a device to them. Does it make them nauseous to quote the Talmud if they think it can help them? Absolutely not. They love it. If you watch all the Jews for Jesus videos and all these other missionary groups, you'll notice they are constantly quoting from the Talmud and Medrash, always out of context, but they're quoting it up and down. Why? Why? Why would they quote it? Because they're in a lot of trouble. You could be sure if there was a passage in the book of Joshua or in First Chronicles that said God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life, they wouldn't be quoting the Talmud. <laughs> they had to quote the Talmud. In Isaiah 53, they can't rescue their flawed interpretation of Isaiah 53 from the book of Isaiah, because Isaiah explicitly states that the servant is Israel in Isaiah 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. You get where this is all going. So they abandon ship in their view that we don't believe in the oral Torah, we only believe in the Bible. They will jump ship immediately and snatch any passage in the Talmud that could rescue their 
um, interpretation of these passages. And if you're watching me now and you're a Christian, if you're watching me now and you've ever been a Christian, if you're watching me now and never been exposed to these Christians, what do you know? You know I'm telling the truth, okay? So the church became uh, very uh, opposed to anything that was part of the oral tradition, the Talmud, any of that, unless it helped them, unless it helped them. They oppose it for many reasons. I'm not going into it now, but the opposition to the oral Torah um, w does not extend itself to when they need to save themselves. Then they use unequal weights and measurements and suddenly will use the Talmud, use uh, rabbinic traditions, and Midrash, anything. They'll use a professor at Reform at Hebrew Union College. I'm not kidding. They will quote professors at Jewish Theological Seminary, the conservative movement. They will quote him as though he's the chief rabbi of Israel, if it will rescue them. Because when you're not telling the truth, you're in a lot of trouble. You had to be very smart, like Mark Twain. <laughs> he was he was not called a humorist for nothing. They said if you if you're not if you're telling the truth, you don't have to keep track of anything. If you're not, you have to be a genius. You know the, that's what they have to keep track of all these things. Let's get back to our topic here. In the Christian Bible, we are told that. Jesus was clearly a Pharisee, and he insisted that being a Pharisee was the gold standard, but not using that verse, because anybody, a Roman soldier, could have observed Jews wearing phylacteries. That doesn't prove anything. To observe it, the person could be a Hindu, but see a Jew with phylacteries on. That doesn't mean that... But, but where you see it is not Matthew 23, 1 and 2. It openly says that the teachings of the Pharisees are directly from God. Do as they say. Do as they bid you. Don't do as they do because they're hypocrites and vipers. And the rest of the chapter is essentially a nuclear attack against Orthodox Judaism. Again, the Pharisee is Orthodox Judaism. Same, same thing. Another source, which is massive, I don't even know where to begin. Another source is the Sermon of the Mount. The Sermon of the Mount, that's Matthew 5, 7, 6, and 7. In there, we are told that Jesus says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and scribes, then you can't go get into heaven. What the heck did he mean? He didn't say unless your righteousness exceeds the Sadducees, because the Sadducees didn't believe in the oral Torah. The, the Pharisees were the standard. Unless you're... Now, you have to understand something very important about this. You say, well, the Jews have traditions. What's wrong with tradition? It's, uh, it's, you've heard Fiddler on the Roof. You've heard the music. No, if the oral tradition is not from God and Jews wringing their hands invented it, made it up, so then it's a prohibition. That's not a good thing because the Torah says that you're not allowed to the add to the Torah nor take away, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. So the Sermon of the Mount is attesting that Jesus believed that the Pharisaic tradition, that means written and oral, is directly from God, or else they would be violating the prohibition found in Deuteronomy 13.1 in the Hebrew Bible. It's the last verse in the Christian Bible of chapter 12. Forget about it. I can give you 500. I, we can do an entire show about this, but I'll give you other huge examples of this. According to the Synoptic Gospels, the, the Last Supper was a Passover Seder. According to John, it was not. According to John, it was not because John dates 
the crucifixion a day earlier than the synoptic gospels, okay? Uh, you won't find any of the accoutrements of a Passover Seder in John chapter 13. Why? I'm not going into it now. I cover this in many other shows. But the Passover Seder that you encounter very vividly in the, um, in the Last Supper, though, that's all oral Torah. That's all oral tradition. That's all rabbinic tradition. Very, very clearly so. That Jesus was wearing tzitzis himself. Yeah. Mark chapter 6, uh, moreover, there's so many morovers, I don't even know where to begin. In John chapter 7, Jesus is using oral Torah and rabbinic interpretation of oral Torah in order to make a case. I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information, but Jesus in uh, chapter 7, I think it's verse 22, he says that pushing back against the notion that he's that it's forbidden to perform any kind of healing on the Sabbath day, or he he brings a proof from a dispensation that's only in the oral Torah. So, ordinarily, just very briefly, it would be forbidden to perform any bloodletting wound on the Sabbath, ordinarily. And therefore, it should be forbidden to perform a circumcision on the Sabbath. However, based on the oral Torah, there's an exception. Now, none of this can be found in the written Torah. There is an exception based on a passage. It's not important what, but there's a massive exception. That is, that if the eighth day the day of circumcision comes out on Shabbos, so then we perform the bris milah, we perform the circumcision, despite the fact that it's Shabbos. Jesus is is trying to out-Pharisee the Pharisees, which means he brings a proof that madach, if you're allowed to heal a small limb on the Sabbath day, meaning perform a circumcision on the Sabbath day, see John 7, 22 and 23, then how much more so could you heal the whole body? So that's oral, that's oral Torah right there, the whole basis. What is even the premise for not healing on the Sabbath day, using medication on the Sabbath day, rescuing a sheep from a pit? I don't want to overwhelm you. It, what is a Sabbath day journey in the book of Acts? Rabbinic traditions of reading the Haftarah on Shabbos. So on the Sabbath day, we read a portion of the Torah, the portion of the Pentateuch, a portion of the five books of Moses, and throughout the year, we go through a cycle in which we read through publicly in the synagogue uh, the entire five books of Moses. It's all divided up, okay? There is a, now, there is a custom, a tradition that actually began Hanukkah began at the time of the Hanukkah period to, in addition to reading from the Torah, which in itself is not in the Torah, specifically read a portion of the law. All right. But there's a, a custom to read a haftar, which means a small section of the prophets. Now, only 4%, 5% of the prophets are read during the yearly cycle, a very small portion. Not like the five books of Moses where everything is read, but rather small portions that somehow relate to that week's portion of the Torah reading. And it developed because the Jews were forbidden to read from the Torah uh, based on the decrees of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. If you don't know who that is, that's the evil man who was the king of the Seleucid Empire, who said it was forbidden for Jews to read from the Torah. So Jews had to read from something, so they instead they read from part of the prophets, which that they were permitted to do, instead of the Torah. And they read. So this is a rabbinic tradition. This is totally Pharisaic. Totally Pharisaic. And we are told in Luke 
chapter 4, verse 16, 17, 18, that Jesus was in a synagogue in Nazareth. Don't be offended, but it wasn't a Reformed temple. <laughs> and Jesus, we're told, read from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. I'm not going to make you nuts because the reading contains a that we find there contains a misquote for a reason that's well, well beyond the scope of this question. I can go on and on and on all over. What's a Sabbath day journey? The Torah says you're not allowed to leave your place on the Sabbath day. Well, what does that mean? You can't walk out of your house on the Sabbath day? Without an oral Torah, you don't even know what that means. So there is a Tchum Shabbos, there is a prohibition of walking more than 2,000 cubits outside of the city limits. That's oral Torah completely, completely. It's found right in the beginning of the book of Acts. So the writers of the Christian Bible explicitly portray Jesus as a Pharisee and Paul, ha ha, Paul knew he was no idiot. He knew very well that if you ain't a Pharisee, you ain't, a, you ain't anything. So he presents himself as a Pharisee of Pharisees because that was the gold standard. You were a Sadducee, so you were, you were that means you, 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 you clean floors for a living. If you clean floors, don't be insulted. But it just meant that was it. And Josephus, in fact, tells us that it was— the hearts of the people with the Pharisees, that was the dominant uh, Judaism. The Sadducees were rather in cahoots with Rome, and in fact, they disappeared after the destruction of the Second Temple. The church would come to reject the oral Torah, and just briefly, why did it do that? And of course, because the Messianic movement is the church, so they do everything the church does. The, the, the church came to reject the oral Torah for many, many reasons. One of them is the Jewish calendar. They were basing Easter, the holiest holiday in the Christian calendar, based on when the Jews said it's Pesach, when it's Passover. The only thing is that Passover is the Jewish calendar is based on oral law. You're going, what are you talking about? It's just the 15th day of the first month. But it's complicated because you have to have a complex calendar to be able to line up the lunar and solar calendars because Passover must come out in the springtime. It's very, it's very complicated, but we have an oral tour of exactly how to measure that. Uh, and where do you see the springtime? Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1. So what happened was is the church began to fight. So Polycarp, an early church father, he based his uh, he he celebrated Easter based on when the Jews said it was Passover. The church got sick of doing that, and at the Council of Nicaea, the lesser known feature of this fourth century council was to reject the notion that Christians would celebrate Easter based on when the Jewish calendar said it was Passover, and that was the end of the oral law. Moreover, the church did get nauseous when they thought that God had vested the Jews with knowledge that they had no access to and therefore rejected it. And, and moreover, they just, the church is viscerally antinomian against ritual law. And what the oral Torah is, this is critical so you understand, what is the oral Torah? So all 613 commandments are in the five books of Moses. The oral Torah is different in nature. People People, I maybe think, I don't know, people maybe think, well, there's five books of Moses, and maybe there's like eight other books, and that's the oral law, and it's just more stuff. No, it's not. It's explaining how to perform the Torah. So, for instance, when we are told in the Torah that you should put these words, bind them to your head and to your heart, on your arm, well, what are you supposed to bind? That's oral Torah, how to do it. What does it mean? So the Torah's commandments are headlines. The oral Torah is how to perform it. When the Torah says you should slaughter an animal only in the manner that I have shown you, 
Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 21, but God doesn't show us anywhere how to properly slaughter an animal. That's oral Torah. Oral Torah is how to do it. The church did, detested the oral Torah because they detested the Jewish people, because they detested the notion that the Jews could be the oracle in which God transmitted his eternal teachings, even though it says so in Romans chapter 3, verse 2, right? They didn't care. They did not care. And the oral Torah really stood for keeping the mitzvot because the oral Torah is there to tell you how to keep the mitzvot. So I would not use Matthew 23, verse 5, that the Pharisees had wide phylactery. That's not the proof. Anyone could have observed Jews wearing tefillin phylacteries. The point is the beginning of that chapter, Matthew 23, 1 and 2. The point is the Sermon of the Mount. The point is John chapter 7. The point is the opening of the book of Acts. The point is Luke chapter 4. And I can go on and on. The early Christians all believe in the oral Torah. And if you would have told the early Christians that there's no oral Torah, they would have sent you to a psychiatrist. However, the church changed and more and more poison infiltrated the early church. And then they divorced themselves from the Jewish people and divorced themselves from the oral Torah unless the oral Torah can get them out of trouble. And if the oral Torah can get them out of trouble, every missionary video site quotes from the Talmud happily, proudly, with their chests out, with no cognitive dissonance. Ah, the Talmud helps us out. We'll show you it's really Jewish. They love to do that. It doesn't make them nauseous. They literally have no shame doing that. And if you follow this topic, you know everything that I am saying is precisely accurate. Thank you for your question. If you enjoyed this program, please like and subscribe. I don't know יציר נברא לעת נעשה בחף צוקו אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא